so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Gold. I currently teach the um, healthcare delivery and HIV AIDS clinic at here, the school. Um, and I have the privilege of introducing the final panel of the day um, that will aim to address where we go from here. So we spent last night and most of today talking a lot about um, the mission of clinical legal education and some of the challenges facing clinical e legal education. And we have an esteemed panel of um, clinical legal education experts that will give their views on where we are headed in the future. So um, without a lengthy introduction, I will just tell you who each of they are. We're going to begin um, with Barbara Bezdek, who's been on the faculty at Maryland Carey since 1988. Um, Barbara combines her interest in the legal foundations of social change with courses designed to help students link theory and practice. Barbara regularly, regularly teaches the clinical seminar Legal Theory and Practice Community Development, and students in this experiential seminar assist clients in low-income communities through legal strategies that support the community's self-determination of revitalization objectives. Barbara's scholarship and teaching explore ways to expand legal opportunities and practical capabilities of disenfranchised communities to participate politically and economically in the public-private redevelopments that impact them. Next, we will hear um, from Bob Kewen, who made the trip in from St. Louis to be with us today. He is Professor of Law and Associate Dean of Clinical Education and Co-Director of the Interdisciplinary Environmental Clinic at WashU. Bob oversees the school's highly ranked clinical education program. He's published extensively on such topics as academic freedom, access to legal representation, environmental justice, environmental enforcement, environmental science, natural resource conservation and professional responsibility. As immediate past president of the Clinical Legal Education Association, Bob is an outspoken advocate for the importance of law school clinics operating in environments free of judicial and legislative interference. And Bob has written a recent article on pricing clinical legal education, which he will, will be the focus of his, many of his remarks today. And finally, we have Deborah Epstein, who is Professor of Law and Director of Georgetown's Domestic Violence Clinic. Deborah served as Associate Dean for Experiential Learning at Georgetown from 2005 to 2012 and spearheaded the development of a new curriculum of more than 30 experiential learning courses at the Law Center, which she will talk about today. Um, Deborah developed and leads the Georgetown Summer Institute on Clinical Teaching, which is a nationally recognized teacher training program. Deborah is published extensively in the areas of family violence and experiential education, including, and here's the plug, her new book, um, The Clinic <laughs> Seminar, which provides a full syllabus of 20 model classes designed for two-hour class sessions with step-by-step with step instructions so that even a first-time clinician can enter the classroom with complete confidence. That was my plug. That was my plug. That was my plug. The book is called The Clinic Seminar. Co-authored with Jane Aiken and it Wally Malenik. It doesn't exist, but it will in two oh. months. <laughs> so stay tuned. Um, so our format for today will um, will have each presenter. We're going to begin with Barbara, then Bob, then Deborah. Each of them will present for about 15, 20 minutes, and we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for questions and discussion. Thank you, Sarah. Well, hello, everybody. You diehards who are still here. I'm so pleased to see you. I'm not going to talk at all about what I do in my clinic. I am instead just going to very briefly make two points as we kind of pivot from this wonderful day uh, talking among insiders who do the hard and wonderful work of clinical teaching and lawyering with our students to think about clinical education in the context of legal education more generally. Um, and so, come with me as I peer into my crystal ball, which was my assignment. Uh, two points briefly, I want, and these are they, I want to talk about uh, the potential of experiential education, which is my preferred term for clinical education, to heal legal education split personality. Uh, we could say it's ambiguity, it's tolerance for ambiguity, but I'll call it a split personality. And I want to say a few words about talking cures. So this is where I want to start. <laughs> Brenda told me I had to be funny if I couldn't be deep. So, <laughs> and we know what a brilliant teacher she is. So here we are. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about clinics? Um, so I dashed down a few of the words that we've heard today 
um, and in my own idiosyncratic way, get color-coded them. Perhaps you can instantly determine what the color coding is, perhaps not, actually. So for example, when we talk about clinical education, we use a lot of words. We are talking about several segments of the orange, if you will. Um, we have been talking about clients in our clinics for the most part, and this group of people is making some references to justice and power and social situation. We talk a lot about the features of law, the context in which students do things with law um, that we want to teach them. And we also implicitly talk about our experiences <laughs> becoming capable lawyers and helping students to move on into the next phase of their own career. Um, but if we were to actually have a conversation, we, uh, in order to discern what should clinical legal education offer general legal education, we would discover, we probably have, you all know this actually, we do not actually have a, a facilitous vocabulary to do this. We do not have the lexicon in order to talk with our colleagues down the hall, much less on the other floors, <laughs> about which things we are focused on doing in our particular clinical courses. Or at least this is the situation in a place that luxuriates in clinical offerings like Maryland does, where we have 20-some clinics and an awesome faculty. And, so, and not enough time <laughs> to talk with each other about what we do. Um, so there's nothing magic about these words. These are only some of the words. Um, and I would just want to observe something I think that we all have the experience of, which is when we assemble a course, we are doing a couple of operations. And these operations are familiar. It's just that these also are not reduced to a routine that is immediately translatable to our colleagues. In our school, we don't even describe these things in our syllabus or in our course selection materials for our students. We tell them other things that matter to us, but not necessarily an integrated or coordinated set of information to help students um, uh, make choices. But we all do say, start out with some kinds of goals and objectives. Recognize here that we might have goals for our sense of our objectives for our students. Uh, we might have our objectives for what are the particular social or professional norms, I'm sorry, that we wish to engage our students with. Social justice might well be one of them. The duty of every lawyer to advance the quality of justice might be another um, version of that same one. Some of us have law reform objectives. Some of us are particularly focused on a kind of lawyering. Um, increasingly, the conversation across the aisle between clinician and non-clinician is what is our responsibility to prepare students for professional life? Sometimes that's about jobs, sometimes that's about skills, sometimes that's about habits of mind and heart. But anyway, we all start with some kind of goals and objectives, and then we choose design elements. And these actually do reflect lots of things on the previous slide over here of um, practice setting. Where in the legal system are we situating our students? Why is that? What skills does that carry with it? We select clients or matters or projects for some set of reasons that, co uh, that, it, that suggest a coalescence around our goals and objectives. We make a whole bunch of pedagogical choices, some you know, from a wide spectrum of people who are very, very focused on a particular pedagogy and have it down minute by minute in their experience with their students to the more improvisational sort of. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so my point here, I'm done with point one. See, I'm moving up the pace here. <laughs> so point one is we don't share a lexicon even among ourselves, even though we can walk in and feel like we can give each other the high fives and we know that we are a we. But when we come to talk even with us, and certainly when we come to defend the role of experiential education as central or, in my view, as we try to take over more of the law school curriculum <laughs> that we don't have available a vocabulary to assist us in that project. Uh, not yet. Perhaps we will develop one. All right, on to point two. Healing legal education split personality. I have a question mark here because I'm not 100% sure that we can do it, but I think that we should do it. We should aim to do this. So legal education, 
our experience, I don't know what your experience of your faculty might be, but in the United States, we actually have a dual identity. We try really hard to hold our own in uh, the university setting as scholars, as public thought leaders, um, and we are also uh, the gateway, and we hold a monopoly on, entry to the legal profession. So we are both a university-based discipline and we are a trade school. We must, we have both sets of obligations. We have taken them both on. That's the split. And so sometimes this creates a fractious abyss <laughs> within law schools. Um, sometimes you might feel that you are at the end of your rope. Um, the, uh, so, and what is this abyss about? It's like, what do we do? How much should we do to prepare our students to practice law? for the duties of an attorney, for the work of lawyers, for the functions of law in society. What is it that we should do? Now, law schools live with this tension, <laughs> and it can be a creative tension. And in schools with a vibrant experiential program, this is a source of tremendous creative energy. I think look at Maryland's 40 years, and you can see that not only is there a fair amount of love and affection and homage for Mike Milliman, there has also been a fair amount of tension and a lot of creativity, a tremendous amount of innovation and new forms and, and um, rearrangement of the building blocks and the personnel to be able, and the thought about what should we be doing in the world, in the community, in the law school. Um, so now, um, law school clinics comprise a key site for advancing the twin missions of law schools. It is a space for a more capacious yet more integrated legal education, to use some of the many words in the Carnegie Report. <sighs> All right, and so what would that look like? That would look like strong steel cables. I don't know what it looks like from you to you, but that's what that is. That's no skinny thread about to break. Those are strong steel cables anchoring our students into their profession into their obligations to a more just society. Now then, what is this guy doing with the rope? Well, he is scaling mountains. He is hanging on for dear life, right? This rope is really important. Um, and that is what I want to speak about for just another minute, which is what is it that law schools do that clinics are particularly well tooled to do, and that is to examine what the law is now. This is what the rest of law school also does. What is the law now? But only now, not what will it be 25 years from now when people are lauding you for regret for being a practitioner for 40 years? You know, everything you learned in law school, they will have changed the civil code by then. You know, you never know. What the law does and does not do is a lot of what happens in clinical courses, of course. This is the law in action, law in operation, law in society. Students come into clinics, they think, oh, I apply law to facts, out pops resolution, done, I'm a lawyer. And then they discover that they don't know what a fact is or how to, ev how to evidence them. And they actually don't know how to find half of the law. And they don't know, you know, there are many things that they are learning to do on the job. And most importantly, they also need to know what lawyers do with it. Now, law school needs to deliver on all three of these things. The first, there's not much contest about. The contest is about how much of the curriculum to devote to this first objective. What the law does and does not do, I would not claim that only clinical education can teach that. Um, I would not say that only classrooms are the most successful place for teaching what the law is. Libraries are a very good place. Um, what lawyers do with law, this requires many kinds of input, right? And so the clinical Pedagogy includes that, lawyer, that students act in role, that students have this responsibility, that they do some of the things selected by their supervisor to do with it. Um, and then what have we been hearing for since last night and all through today? Lawyers do a thousand things. Therefore, clinics need to be, I hate to say a thousand points of light, but there are thousands of kinds of clinics, right? Back to my point number one, we can't say what clinic adds to the curriculum composition until we say many more things. But we want our students to graduate with the capacity to use those darn cables, because where would we be without them? We would be in the dark, absolutely. All right, so. Um, 
Education. We're all about education. Education is what we're left with after we've all left school, right? So who was it, I think? It was you who said, the thing you want your student to learn is how to learn, how to keep learning, how to continue to be challenged by the justice demands of our clients and to challenge oneself to learn new tools, learn new skills, go make new partnerships to be able to go do that kind of thing. So what am I saying? I am saying old things with new urgency. The old news is the importance of doing as part of the education um, we learned this from Jerome Frank, we learned, none of us know him personally, but Jerome Frank, Tony Amsterdam, the McCrate Report, the Carnegie Report, all of these things which have been shining the lights on legal education and saying, why can't more legal education involve more lawyer-like activity? Um, and um, we recognize that law students become lawyers when they start doing the things that enact their understanding, that apply their analysis of legal principles in the things that lawyers do. Um, the new urgency is all of this sturm und drang around legal education now. So now we are constantly, all of us, anxious about who will come to law school. Will enough people go come to law school? Will the law school be able to provide for the citizens and non-citizens of the country that which we need skilled lawyers to be able to do? That is the under um, we, we can't overstate that challenge. Um, so it's my view, legal education has got to devote still more resources, greatly more resources um, and attention to what lawyers do in the world, what lawyers are called upon to do in the world. That's all the things up here on the list, you know, and more. This one. Um, what do we want them to do in clinics? What do we want them to do as a result of their legal education? We need them to internalize the habits of excellent lawyers, habits of thought and action. We need them to be able to conduct themselves in the roles and relationships of lawyers. And in clinic, we need them to be able to do that in order to develop these wherever they are, whether that's in clinic or whether you'd call an externship a clinic or any of these other places. They need the assistance, the guidance of knowledgeable others in order to be able to approach the problems and learn from approaching the problems that lawyers encounter. So my final point is just this. Um, ideally, we deploy the intellectual and practical strands of our split personality um, into the strands of a sturdy rope, those sturdy steel coils. They're integrated rather than treated separately or even serially. Clinicians have done a tremendous amount of work to build, to develop that deep well and broad net of thinking about how we move novices through the stages of many kinds of lawyers' work. We have an awful lot to offer to the pros prospects of a recombinant education of lawyers for society. So I'm modestly hopeful. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I want to thank uh, Michael Pinard for inviting me. And particularly, I, I'm really pleased that I got here last night, um, both to hear uh, about the other Michael and much of the work that he's done that I never knew about. But also, I was very pleased to hear Dr. Perman uh, in his remarks uh, bragging about all of the clinical work that goes on in all the schools on campus, right, and, and, and comparing uh, what goes on at the University of Maryland Law School with what's going on at the medical school and the pharmacy school and the nursing school and the dentistry school and the school of social work. But what he might not know is just how unique that is, how unique the University of Maryland really is to be like that, and, and in some respects what an outlier it still is. And so today I want to ask why. Why, why is it? Why is it, you know, 25 years after the Cardin uh, uh, legislation that clinical legal education is still not universal. Um, and I want to look at uh, a little bit about what the arguments have been put forth against it and of what has really held it back. And based on some research, you know, some empirical uh, information, both qualitative and quantitative, push back on that a little bit uh, on, that, on that claim. 
So why do I say law is an outlier? And some of you have seen this chart that's, that I've uh, put together, right? And that's because the numbers at the bottom show we do a pathetically inadequate job of exposing our students while in their professional school to the kind of practice-based education that the others do. Um, amazingly, uh, the ABA, for almost 20 years, uh, in interpreting a standard that said students shall have substantial instruction and professional skills, issued an opinion that said that one credit was substantial. Uh, last month, they decided that maybe that was embarrassing and they've gone to six credits. Um, <laughs> But they still, of course, have no, no clinical requirement, unlike all the other professional schools except for architecture, where I guess a clinical requirement architecture would be a little scary. Um, I'll note this just so some people wonder. I've not included in the one or the six credits uh, legal search and writing, which I appreciate the ABA has allowed as few as two credits to match, because almost across all the other disciplines, most of them also have an introductory methods course in the first year that's not what I've been counting. And I surely, Make no apologies for not including the upper class legal research and writing requirement, which at every school I've been at, and I've been at five, that is quite frankly a term paper or a research paper. It's got nothing to do with practice. I look at who teaches it, right? Um, and so the interesting thing as well is that all of these professions have an apprenticeship or an internship program even before you get licensed on top of this, right? And so surely all of this I know strikes uh, many people, and Erwin Chemerinsky uh, among them, is really indefensible, right? Really quite astounding that we've provided for such money that we've asked, such an incomplete education and such inadequate uh, preparation uh, for the practice of law. But I'm not so sure that's held uh, universally and surely not among our doctrinal co colleagues, right? Because some of them think that really law is only about thinking and rules and Brian Leiter being a prime example, right? And somehow making some claim that law is different it's different from every other profession and that there really isn't a need to, uh, you know, to learn how to, to actually practice as long as you can continue to sort of think through your way through rules. Um, but I just would like to posit at least on the initial question of do students need it, um, what others have said with all due respect to Brian Leiter, right? Um, and of course, first, surely the Carnegie uh, study, which was surely the most informed study of, that's ever been done of legal education. Uh, understood the need uh, for this apprenticeship of practice and the gross absence of that at this particular point in time. And even more recently, an ABA task force had the distinction of putting out a 40-page draft with not a single reference, um, had to admit that they heard that legal education wasn't working, right, and, and came to the conclusion that the mix of courses between doctrinal and practice had swung way too far the other direction towards the graduate school model and need to get back to, to where other professional schools were. And as a result of the problems facing our students, bar associations have surely woken up. And there have been numerous reports uh, by at least three states as well as Illinois and California, all really coming to the same conclusion. That is not only that students are not getting enough practice-based coursework, but they really need to be put in role. They really need to be given a clinical training and that the, their last few years really need to be uh, transformed. And when we ask recent law grads, what do you think, right? What do you think about this? Um, you know, the, the best study to date, the after the JD study, asking uh, students to rank two or three years into their careers, the things in law school that were most useful. You have everything practice-based at the top, including employment, and then the doctrinal course is really way down the line. And even just asking our recent graduates in this survey, uh, from those who graduated the past summer, they too uh, see the need uh, for more uh, legal uh, practice education and that therefore they didn't get enough of it. And, and something I think is really quite astounding, a couple hundred representatives of the Young Lawyers Division of the ABA at their most recent meeting in August um, talked about the need uh, to have at least an academic grading period. That would be the 15 credits that you've heard bandied about, um, really dedicated to these clinical experiences as a condition uh, of graduation. So let's think about what we have lined up here, right? So on one side, we have the Carnegie Report, numerous ABA reports, McCrate, lots of them before that. Uh, every bar association in the last few years that's looked at this, all of their reports. All sorts of surveys of recent grads and new lawyers, all saying that there's something grossly inadequate with legal education that's failure to provide students with clinical experience. And on the other side, 
the academics. You know, the academics continue to claim that, that the sort of big law model of the past will still train them, even though big law has shrunk. And many of them, of course, never practiced at all. And if they did practice, it's been years ago. It's really, to me, quite a, an amazing situation where the accreditation of legal education has been captured, uh, essentially, I think, unlike the other professions, by people uh, that don't practice. I have to believe that when those other uh, those other professions figured out what needed to be done in their schools. They started with the practicing members of their profession, asked them, and then simply turned to the professional schools and told them to figure out a way to practice it. Um, the other thing that's been thrown out is we just can't afford it, right? I mean, this clinical education thing is, my gosh, you know, eight, ten students to one, it's just, it's way, way beyond. This is sort of the boogeyman, right? This is that sort of <coughs> ominous thing in the closet, right, at night that scares everybody away, right? Never mind that every other professional school has figured out how to do it. Um, and never mind that often when people talk about it, they're talking about extremely low cost externships in virtually no cost adjunct taught simulations. And never mind that this claim is being made by the Yale uh, endowed professors <laughs> at the school that surely of all of us has enough money uh, to afford it. But I will accept their impressions of the boogeyman and I want to turn on the lights for them and show them that it, it just exists in the closet and when you come out uh, it's not doesn't the emperor in a sense doesn't have any clothes and share with you some of this research I have very quickly uh, to show why this issue of cost at least the issue of price and cost to students is not in fact a sufficient justification for not having universal clinical education when I started this I, I started very anecdotally right I thought to myself well who is doing it right what schools have dedicated not just uh, clinical experiences, but really at least a quarter of the students' upper class uh, to experiential education. And I came up with CUNY um, and University District of Columbia, and then most recently, Washington Lee uh, and their adoption uh, of this particular requirement. Um, and if you think about it, these are really quite, quite, quite different schools, right? Um, uh, we have rural and urban. We have public and private. We have extremely expensive and not so expensive. Um, we have fairly highly ranked and not so fairly high ranked. We have a school that aspires to send its school, its students around the country and those that aspire more locally. And yet they've all, they've all been able to figure out a way to do it. And interestingly, when I dug a little more into to Washington Lee and, and pulled up some numbers on them beyond the quote at the bottom um, by Jim Moliterno, who looked at the pricing of it after a couple of years, we really found it quite amazing what they did, right? So in the, in the, in the spring of 2008, their faculty voted to phase in within three years a mandatory 20 credit uh, experiential requirement in the last year of law school, including a clinical experience. And you can see how much they geared up, right? They greatly increased their simulations and field placements and actually doubled the number of clinical placements that were uh, available to students. And amazingly, with all due respect again to the Yale professors, they did it without increasing the tuition there disproportionately to what their peers were doing across the country. So this got me interested in crunching some numbers, which you know many of, us, of you have, that I've done. And I pulled a lot of available data from the ABA, the information that all law schools purport. I have probably 10,000 data points on this and can track any school and where they sit vis-a-vis -vis others. Uh, some U.S. News ranking information, which you'll see I use in a minute. I use some of our CSAIL survey data. Let me put in a plug for that. The beginning of the CSAIL survey was today. If you heard the earth move around 11 a.m., it's because we sent out the first surveys to all the clinical program directors, and so hopefully they'll get their surveys back within a few weeks, and then you'll all get your individual survey. And then I was curious, in speaking with my uh, colleague up the hall, Brian Tamanaha, about whether cost of living might be driving tuition, okay? And so I took all this data, entered into spreadsheets, asked the question, what's going on? Uh, and got a really smart postdoc uh, PhD in political science to, to run numbers for me. The first thing I want to make clear is there are surely some things that are driving tuition. There are surely some things that are the reason why students are paying certain amounts of money and, and certain amounts of money vis-a-vis -vis schools. Whether you attend a public or private school is probably the most significant factor in how much you pay, as there's on average a $17,500 difference between what schools students pay at those two schools. Those numbers are very robust. Those p-values over there show you this is really a, 
quite significant. Ranking matters, right? It matters $100 of tuition for each place. So that means the difference between being 50th and 40th is that you can charge $1,000 more. Or if, in fact, you're 100th versus 1st, um, that would be $10,000 more that you could charge. Whether you're ranked or doesn't rank matter, just as a general average there, st students at underranked schools pay less. And then cost of living matters. Surely cost of living clearly matters for schools that charge over $35,000. And this fancy adjusted R-square number at the bottom means that, at least from a statistical point of view, the belief is that these factors alone explain 74% of variations in tuitions among law schools. So even if we're worried about what's, what's the impact of clinical requirements on schools, we're chasing a pretty small amount in with every other cost in the school, right? This is really what's driving cost, and you'll see at the end, I'll talk a little bit about perhaps why. So then I went and decided I wanted to look at a few things, right? So the first thing I decided to look at is what about experiential coursework, right? Because I was pushing hard for the ABA to adopt a 15 credit requirement, and I've been trying to help California stick to it on their 15 credit requirement. And what I went and did is this, is I pulled ABA data and I was able to get the number of positions that each school reports are available in three types of courses. They're simulation courses. Uh, their law clinic courses, and then the number of students actually placed in their field placement courses. And then I normalized it to get a ratio, right? I took that number, could be 1,000, could be 1,500, divided by the number of 1Ls. And so then what I got was, in a sense, a ratio per student, right? How many of these experiential courses are available at that school per student? And then I regressed it against the tuition charge, and then you can see at the bottom, uh-uh, it -uh, doesn't matter, right? Some slight in fact, effect in the opposite direction, but that p-value shows that th th there's just no effect there. This is just, there is no relationship between the amount of, of, of experiential coursework a school is offering and tuition. A school can offer a ton of it, and you can't see a tuition difference between the schools that are offering very, very little or none at all. This is sort of, sort of visually what that looks like. If there was a relationship, the line would look like this. The fact that the line is flat, and those bands are basically the error width, and it could just as easily be a little bit in the other direction, shows that this is just simply not true. With all due respect to the Yale professors, whatever they think the internal cost is, students are not paying any more at all at schools that have gone out of their way to provide more experiential coursework. Then I wanted to go in and really look at the clinical issue, right? So I looked at schools at that time, 23, I think we're up to 25, that like Maryland, mandate that a student take either, maybe unlike Maryland, uh, either a credit-bearing law clinic or an externship, right, based on some work of Karen Tokars and others. Again, no, no relationship at all, right? There's, in fact, they charge $1,000 less, but again, that p-value shows you that this is just a statistic that does not show a relationship. There is no relationship there that anyone could go around and say, oh, if you mandate clinic, it's going to cost more. Let me show you a picture here, and, and don't, don't, don't get lost right away. Let me, stay with me, right? This is a scatter plot of what I've been doing, right? And here is a scatter plot of what I just showed you in terms of schools and whether they mandate a clinical experience or not, right? And your school is one of those dots, right? And the lines are going to show you what I just mentioned, right? So the two lines uh, that are sloping downward from left to right uh, are the difference between public and private schools. And you can see with that gap, that's the $17,500 I talked about. And over to the right is the gap uh, between ranked and unranked schools, right? You'll then see the slope of the line, right? The slope of the line isn't showing you what we talked about earlier about how ranking matters, right? Because you see here, as, as a school's rank goes up in the sense of a higher number in the rank, uh, the amount they charge went down. And the thing I was testing are the little lines uh, uh, together, both at the top and the bottom. And that was supposed to be looking, is there a difference between at a private school if they mandate a clinic or not in a public school? Oh my gosh, uh, I gotta move fast. And the fact that those lines are really close together says there's not. Can I still minutes? I also said, well, what about the possibility that after schools adopt a clinical requirement, they've increased their tuition faster? No, again, not the case. In fact, if anything, those schools seem to have slowed their tuition increase after that happened. What about the relationship generally 
of the amount of clinical experiences available in a school to tuition, right? So here, same way, I said, how many slots are available in law clinics at a school? How many slots are available in externships at a school? And let's see if that matters, right? And I went to see, are there enough slots at schools to provide everybody right now with a clinical experience, either a, a law clinic experience or an externship experience. Besides the fact that 79% of the schools could, even though only about 15, 18% do, again, there's no relationship between the schools that are providing enough for every student now and those that are not. And then I say, well, what if I run it as a, a, a straight line variable, right? Um, and look at instead law clinics, the boogeyman, right? The thing that everybody's so scared about, right? And so I did the same thing here. I said, okay, how many positions is your school allowing in clinics, right? And some schools might have had a three to one ratio where they had a lot of clinics available for students and some schools had zero. And again, no relationship, no relationship. The schools that are providing a law clinic experience are not charging more in tuition. Then I thought, what about the schools that have enough law clinic space to provide experience to everybody? Not That's just law clinic and externship. 40 some schools today could go ahead and make it a law clinic requirement. And again, no, right? Numbers gotten a little bigger here and the p-value is a little closer, but I've seen too many of these statistics to think that this really means something, right? Still is not even at the 90% level, a number that we should think we could rely on. I then figured I got to keep looking at this because no one's just going to believe this, right? No one's going to believe that it's not costing more to provide law clinics, right? So then I went and said, well, what about the relative proportion by which a school offers this to school students? In other words, what about schools that offer lots of clinics and few externships? Are they charging more than schools that have the opposite? Lots of externships and no clinics? Again, no, just not at all. $11 difference and a p-value again that's just not there, okay? And finally, I said, well, what about the schools from the C-cell study where there's a greater percentage of students that actually participate in a law clinic, right? Because that was a student that asked, how many of your students will graduate with a law clinic experience? Again, nothing there, right? A negative direction, but a p-value that makes no sense, okay? And then I said, what about ranking, right? And I looked at the top 15 programs. Surely there, right? Surely there, students are having to buy this value, right? Again, nothing at all, right? Some, val some number, right? 850, I'm, again, going in the wrong direction for what everybody is going to say is happening. Um, which means it's really nothing happening at all because the p-value doesn't make any sense. So when I first started giving this presentation, which I'll conclude in one minute maybe, is that people wonder, well, how can this be, right? I mean, my faculty was so doubting. It was incredible, right? And so I said, okay, let me go try to figure this out. So let's just think about it, right? My, why might this be the case, right? Well, maybe, you know what? Maybe these clinical courses haven't quite cost as much as everybody's claimed, right? Because if you look at the examples here, most of us or many of us across the country don't get paid as much, right? Most of us or many of us across the country actually teach more than we're supposed to teach because we do doctrinal courses. Many programs have added fellows to figure out a way to more economically get this. We talked about Cypre awards, we get grants, we get attorney's fees, and particularly when we bunch it in with something else, right? We bunch law clinics in with externships, they're fairly low cost. And if we talk about experiential coursework generally, again, my gosh, we have adjunct taught courses at my school, do 90% of those. They're getting like $2,000, $3,000, right? So I think we've overstated the cost of this particular form of education. I also think that relative to all the other things we're spending money on in this building, or a my building, excuse me, uh, I think the cost of clinical education is not really all that big a deal, right? I mean, at my school, even though we've got a lot of clinical faculty, it's still small, 10, 15% maybe in comparison to the others. Um, there's unbelievable cost in the building, of course, for faculty scholarship in terms of summer grants and all the rest. Financial aid is clearly driving so much today. Look at the discount rates we're giving, new buildings, which we go up the street, increased cost of unit payments to university at the University of Baltimore, estimated to be 30, 40%. And so I think that this, whatever the cost is, the additional cost of clinical education or experiential education, it's just not potentially at least such a large portion of a, of a school's budget that it drives what they charge. And then the law and econ guy in my faculty said, hey, there's a pricing theory here. This is all very simple. You can't charge more, right? Students don't value this. Students don't pay anymore, right? 
You're right, you know, so you got to eat the cost, just like anybody else, right? Well, you know, you see, I'm not so sure about that, right? S surveys show this is what students, students value. In fact, behind location, uh, the, the, the reputation or the, the, the value or the, uh, the, the, the perception of the clinical program is the number two reason why schools pick one school over the other in their final analysis, really quite stunning. It also assumes that there's normal pricing and, and nobody, and nobody believes that pricing of tuition is normal, right? Everybody says in higher education generally, it's not driven by the usual sort of theories, right? And so maybe this, right? This is sort of a Brian Tamanaha theory. Maybe it's really, tuition's not about cost at all, right? It's about prestige. It's about what you're buying. What are you buying? What is a student buying? They're buying the name of the school. They're buying, you know, the ranking of the school. They're buying whatever, right? And there's lots of reasons why we could think this is true, and university officials pretty much say that. This is exactly what we do. We price vis-a-vis -vis our competitors. One of my deans once when I said, how are you going to figure out tuition next year? He says, well, I'm going to look around what three or four of the competitors are, make ours a little bit less. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, and why might this be true, that this is insensitive? Because I ran some more data, right? So I asked the ABA, can you give me some of the instructional cost data? Schools have to report how much they spend of their budget on instructional costs. I said, if I could get that, I could regress that against all this other stuff. Like, nah, you, that's the holy grail of schools and you can't get in there. So I did a surrogate, right? Because you can get student-faculty ratios, right? Which seems to me a reasonable issue. School that has a, a lower ratio is probably spending more on instructional costs than schools with higher. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh, again. Even that doesn't drive tuition. What about libraries? All these books, they're costing us more, they're costing us more. Well, they may be costing you more, but students, again, aren't feeling that, right? So maybe a little of all this is going on, right? We're, we're not quite as expensive as everyone said we were, right? And we're really not a large portion vis-a-vis -vis other things going on in school. And at the end of the day, price does not reflect cost. It pretty much reflects what schools can get. And so that if there are higher costs in the school, they reallocate resources, right? You want a bigger clinical program? Maybe you do a little less over here, right? It's not impossible. It's just a matter of choice, right? So I'll conclude about eight minutes late that I, I cannot find any evidence, and I'm more than happy to run anything else anyone suggests that experiential courses broadly, or even if we dig down into clinical courses, or even if we dig down into law clinics, they're really not a measurable factor in what students are paying in tuition. And this says two things, right? Students that are getting even more, students that have the opportunity to be a school like yours or mine, are not paying more in tuition. But the, 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 the outrageous thing is that students at schools that are not getting this opportunity are not enjoying any economic benefit at all. Because quite frankly, we can do this without increased costs. This is a matter of will and of reallocating resources. It's not a matter of burdening students. Thank you. Yeah, just hit big. <laughs> just hit big for blank. The math is over. <laughs> there will be no more math. Um, so Bob is talking about why not clinical education for everyone. We spent a lot of the day talking about expanding experiential learning. And in the aftermath, as everyone has said, in the aftermath of the Carnegie Report in 2007, this series of highly critical pieces in the New York Times, endless blog posts, all of us across the country have taken a deep breath and started to be very introspective about the quality of education we're providing to our students, and particularly thinking about expanding experiential learning. I think I'm using experiential in some ways the way Bob is using clinic um, and not talking so much about simulation, but it is true that the vocabulary is, is clinical. Um, okay, so I'm going to say experiential. So, so, so no, the ABA has adopted <laughs> right. all this. You're going to see it in the I'm, I'm not stuff. the ABA. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so we're looking at expanding, and I think that's an incredibly welcome development for law schools. But I am concerned that despite all the talk about how, how that we must expand, there's relatively little serious engaged discussion about how we should expand. How should we do it? And we know, clinicians know that process matters and structure matters and being intentional and goal-driven matters. So we need to think carefully about what our goals are, what are our concrete pedagogical goals for student learning. We need to think about how do our structures of experiential learning support those goals. We need to think through the strategic implementation 
of major changes to the curriculum. How can we make it happen um, and make sure that it, it is implemented properly? And how do we think about ensuring quality in the, in the immediate term and the long term? So I want to talk about the how, um, and then everyone can <laughs> exit at the end of the day. Um, I want to talk about the how, and I'm going to do it through the example of a curricular expansion at Georgetown um, that Sarah referred to, we have developed, um, during my deanship, we developed a whole new curriculum called the Practicum Curriculum at Georgetown. It's a whole new series of experiential learning courses. It is 33 courses now, so it's about the size of a small law school curriculum. Um, we are a very big law school. But I'm hoping that by placing um, the how in the context of a concrete example, you can get a sense of what might play out at your school and uh, what might not. Um, so let me just situate this at Georgetown for a moment. Georgetown obviously has a long, um, like University of Maryland, a long um, history of commitment to experiential learning. But we have um, the, the experiential learning that we offer at Georgetown is in a very specifically defined format. Um, it's clearly defined. So clinics at Georgetown mean uh, live client representation. It means supervised by a tenure track faculty member who is, who, th those are the supervisors. It's not externally based. It means very heavily credited. The typical clinic at Georgetown is one semester and 10 credits, the vast majority of your credit load. It means a lot of administrative support. So uh, administrative assistant and office suite, fellows, all of those kinds of things. And that's our model. Um, I think that we've actually achieved a lot of the success we've achieved at uh, Georgetown by holding tight to a particular model, but it's also limited our flexibility and creativity. Then we have an externship program. That's our other source of experiential learning before this curricul practicum curriculum um, was adopted. And there we have lots and lots of potential placements, very, very little credit, <laughs> um, and not a very strong uh, seminar component. A few meetings, um, but because students are placed in such diverse workplaces, the focus of those seminars um, are mostly how do you make the most of mentors, how do you think about professionalism and ethics, but not subject matter specific. So those were our two areas. And so when I came into the uh, clinical deanship, which thank God I am not anymore, <laughs> so I have time to do things like this. Um, I really wanted to see if we could adopt something that would complement the clinics and the externships at Georgetown. And so we started um, by thinking about goals. What would our student learning goals be if we were going to adopt something new? And I put together an ad hoc committee of people who I consider to be opinion leaders in the non-clinical and in the clinical faculty to get together. And what we charged the committee with was thinking about what should students know, understand, be able to do upon graduating from our law school that's not sufficiently supported in the curriculum as it exists right now. Okay, what should they be able to do that we're not giving them enough opportunity to learn? And we framed the charge to the committee that way for a reason. Um, anyone who has worked in law school administration for a New York Minute knows that if you Define, if you charge a committee with, should we expand in this way, um, the whole process is going to be so derailed by a conversation about opportunity costs, because in fact, unless you have a major gift with a specific target, the pie is limited. It just is. And so people who think we should expand in private law or public law or experiential learning are going to have that conversation, and you may never get to the substantive conversation. So we tried to look at what we were doing at Georgetown, and we did a survey of everyone, the full-time faculty, visitors, adjuncts. We have a huge adjunct program. Um, and we actually, and we asked people, what kinds of habits of mind, competencies, skills are students leaving your class with? What's your targeted goal? And what kind of pedagogical practices do you use to support those learning goals? Um, and actually, it's worth doing that because you learn a lot about what's happening under the radar screen, and your colleagues are probably doing really creative things that you don't know about. But one of the things we got to, um, which is where I expected us to get, was that um, the things that are not well supported in our curriculum 
are best supported by live client field work experiences. We are really, really good at analysis, teaching students, giving many opportunities to analyze appellate cases, to write papers and think about the abstract theory of law, many opportunities, fewer to think about other things. So we came up with a list of these learning goals. It's a long list, but I want to give you some of the, some of the ones that I think we highlighted as most important. One was learning to exercise judgment. Um, another was understanding the meaning of professionalism in the legal field. Another was using collaborative approaches to strategic problem solving across practice areas and contexts. Not that much of that going on outside of clinic. Recognizing injustice and appreciating the ability and responsibility of lawyers to respond to it. We've talked a lot about that today. Understanding how to exercise power and the consequences of doing so. Um, and finally, dealing with factual chaos, right? Recognizing that factual chaos is the way the world works and then figuring out how to deal with it. And so once we had this list of student learning goals that we didn't have too many opportunities for students um, to engage with, the committee really came to the decision collectively that what we needed was more field work based experiential learning. Um, so there we were. Um, and we needed to start to think about structure. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time about this because it's probably pretty specific to Georgetown. But what we decided we would do to complement the clinics and the externships was something in the middle, which would have both a substantive seminar component, sub a subject matter specific substantive law component, and a very rich field experience um, component as well. And so much of the learning would come from the connection that students were making between the experiences they were having in the field and opportunities in seminar to reflect on the meaning of those experiences and the connection to the subject matter law. Right? So how is the theory borne out or not borne out in practice and learning from that. Uh, but somewhere mid-level mid credits uh, between externships and clinics for us less of a commitment of their time, and not having the responsibility of being the lawyer for the client. Okay, so that's the structure we picked. Um, okay, so then we had committee agreement to, um, to embark on a new area of the curriculum, and I, know, I knew we needed to get faculty buy-in. Um, Bob had a bunch of statistics about the Washington and Lee experiment, where they've done something very dramatic with their third year, but there was a lot of Dean strong arming in that program, and the faculty has um, implicitly and explicitly um, resisted, and it has become a big problem at the school. Um, Top-down programs are complicated um, and don't always um, are, are not always as effective. Um, as ones where there's faculty buy-in. So I tried to look at what are the biggest obstacles that I can anticipate and how can I avoid them or overcome them. And I'm just going to mention two. Um, these are obviously different at different schools. But I knew that one source of resistance to this would be the non-clinical faculty because of the idea of opportunity costs. Like, why are we putting our resources here? I've got other ideas. We need, uh, we need many, many more IP courses or whatever it is. Um, and so one of the ways I tried to overcome that obstacle was something I've already mentioned, which is including non-clinical opinion leaders in the committee in the first place. They had then been engaged in, for a year on this committee, on this work, were totally bought into the idea that we weren't giving students these opportunities in a sufficient um, enough number. And then we sent them door to door to talk to all of their friends about what they had found. And that, I think, really decreased the resistance to this idea before we ever really brought it to the faculty. We didn't get the faculty to vote on it, but we did present it to the faculty and try to get real buy-in. Um, another thing I did was to have brown bag lunches and individual meetings with non-clinical faculty who had some practice experience to talk to them about why they might want to teach one of these courses and help them think about courses they want to teach. Um, I know that if our faculty, and we're not, if we don't rely exclusively on adjuncts, but our faculty is doing this work, this is going to stick um, and people are going to buy into it. And a number of our faculty, I think now, I can think of about 10 of these courses now that are being taught by our faculty who have not had a history of teaching in an experiential way. 
Um, so I talked individually with them. And then I did a matchmaking <laughs> service, basically, where I took doctrinal faculty and found practitioners who I thought they would really like and be interested in their work and said, why don't you co-teach a course? Um, and think about how this might expand opportunities for you for scholarship, um, for engagement in your teaching. And several of those few, I, I had less success at that for obvious reasons, but some of those really got off the ground and some um, really interesting partnerships came of that. Okay. And we gave small grants, very small, but little grants for development of these courses. So a bunch of different incentive systems to have non-clinical faculty, well, anyone buy in. It's just clinical faculty are less likely to also teach these courses uh, just because of the workload. OK, so this, the other area that I was worried about was the clinical faculty. How would they feel about this kind of new experiential model? Um, one issue w that was raised by several of my colleagues was if we have options, fewer students are going to be interested in taking the clinics, which is not good for the clinical faculty. Um, I wasn't as worried about that because we have way, way more students who want to take clinic than can. We do not provide a clinic for every student, not even close at Georgetown. So a reduction um, in demand, it would be overall a good thing. Um, and what, but what I did to try to address this for people who were concerned was to hold a bunch of information sessions for students to talk about what are the different experiential learning opportunities that exist at this school and what can you learn from them. Not a clinics are the best or externships are the best, but in an externship you can learn a lot about real life practice, how fast it is, how underfunded it is, all of those kinds of things that you're never going to, you shouldn't be learning in a clinic because we should have very few clients and dig really deep. But you're not going to learn what you learn in a clinic where you take on the role of lawyer, right, and have real responsibility for the client. They're different and they're complementary. And what actually happened when we put this program into place, uh, it, it started with about 16 courses, and now it's become 30, oh, 33. Um, the first year it was up in the 30s, clinic applications increased pretty significantly. Now, those may not be causally related. I'm sure Bob could do a regression analysis and tell me <laughs> if I worked closely with him. But they, they, they did happen to be true, and it may well be that um, an increase in opportunities for experiential learning makes students want to do more experiential stuff. Um, okay, um, the other concern that I knew that clinicians ha would have, um, and I shared it, and Bob, I think, referenced this earlier, was that if you offer a whole range of experiential courses, there may be a weakening of the institutional commitment to clinics. Um, and we don't want that if we're clinicians. Um, I don't want that. And I was quite worried about that. And I actually, in embarking on this project, our then dean, Alex Alenikoff, was very interested in expanding experiential opportunities. And I went to him and said, I'm only going to do this, take this project on, if you make some kind of serious commitment to also expanding the clinical program so no one has to worry about this. Otherwise, I'm not in it. Um, and he did. And we actually added two clinics, which we hadn't done in a very long time at Georgetown during this same period of expansion. And I do think that a trusting, tight relationship with your dean is essential if you're going to do a, a, a major overhaul of the curriculum and still protect your clinics. OK, last thing, um, ensuring quality. So I really wanted this to be a big curricular expansion. And that meant we would have to rely in part on adjuncts. Um, and some on adjuncts who hadn't taught for us before. And so it was really important to know that these, we had these nice student learning goals. How are we going to know if people were going to teach to those goals? And so we did six things, which I'm going to spend two minutes, <laughs> if I can, um, to try to maintain quality. The first thing was that I met in person with every single person who was going to teach one of these courses, whether they had been on the faculty for twice as long as I had, um, or they were an adjunct. And we talked about the learning goals we had and what we wanted in terms of the connection between the doctrinal work that was happening in the seminar and the practice work, and talked about how a course could be created um, that would make those connections. We then. Um, developed a specialized course proposal form. I don't know what the course, the new course review is like here, but at Georgetown it's pretty low key. 
uh, and we had a separate committee to review these course proposals and it was a um, long set of essay questions. <laughs> what is the student field work going to look like? What is your role as a teacher going to be in terms of supervising the field work? What are the places in which you expect to bring the field work activity into the seminar? Um, so there was, so you really had to invest up front in, in designing these courses um, and not just write a sort of one paragraph uh, summary and say, this is my reading syllabus, these are the topics I'm going to teach. It was much more in-depth than that. And we're still using <coughs> that, um, <coughs> sorry, that course proposal form. Um, and I chaired that committee for the first two years. It's now chaired by a really wonderful colleague of mine, Bob Stumberg, and we didn't accept almost any proposals without bringing the person in to talk to the committee about questions that we had. So it was a pretty rigorous process, and I think people then took it pretty seriously. We rejected some proposals. I think that was a good thing. Um, okay, then with uh, Jane Aiken and John Copacino, two of my wonderful, wonderful teachers um, who are my colleagues, we mandated a half-day teacher training session for everybody who was teaching one of these courses. And we spent some time talking about how do you backwards design classes from your student learning goals. Um, then we asked everybody to think about what are some of the fundamental insights from practice that in your course that you expect students to have? What are they going to learn from their field work? And then where, what are the touch points in their field work and in your seminar syllabus where those insights are going to come to the surface? And then we spent time designing learning activities that would integrate those insights into the, uh, into the seminar component of the class and share those with each other. Um, uh, there was a lot of resistance to people coming in for half a day to be trained as teachers, um, even though that's not very long to be trained as a teacher, in fact, but they loved it. Even people who've been teaching for years ended up really, I think, happy about the opportunity to have a conversation and not teach in complete isolation and think about it. Um, okay, last two things. We did a special student um, evaluation form, different from for other classes, where students actually talked about the quality of their field work, the extensiveness and quality of the supervision, and the teacher's ability to connect the two things. What, how did they learn? What did they learn that integrated theory um, and practice? And then at the end of the semester, we brought everybody back together. And we talked about what they were most successful at in terms of integrating the field work into the classroom, what didn't work. And then we debriefed about why what was successful was and why what wasn't successful wasn't. And people really liked, the teachers really liked that too. So this was a very labor intensive process. Our fellowship program is a very labor intensive fellowship program. But I think it has really helped make this um, new sort of slice of the curriculum really high quality, really robust. We have 33 courses. It translates into about 375 student seats doing experiential work. That's a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm really thrilled about it. Um, we have courses on global health, climate change, public utility regulation, tobacco control, right to counsel, rights and challenges of low-wage workers, mass incarceration and solitary confinement. It goes across the board. Many, many more opportunities than we used to have. I actually taught um, one of these courses with a colleague. We taught a family law course, a very traditional family law course, but it was called Family Law, a Domestic Violence Perspective. And all the students had to go down to court with me and interview someone who was seeking a protection, a civil protection order, help them draft a complaint, and then come into the classroom and watch the process of the person doing an ex parte hearing for a temporary protection order. I did all of them because the students couldn't do them. They weren't in a clinic. But they watched, and they helped to prepare the client for that. And then also as a group, 
the students wrote a white paper. They did uh, research about service of process in civil protection order cases, which had really fallen apart in the District of Columbia. You can't get access to justice if you can't get service of process done, and it wasn't happening. I was watching cases drop uh, out of court because there was no service. And so students interviewed uh, people who had failed to get service of process, wrote up their stories in a, um, in a report, and then connected those stories to federal and local obligations for the District of Columbia to provide free service of process. And then they presented that paper to the chief of police, the chief of the DC Superior Court, the local trial court, um, and others in an effort to really change that process. That was a very different family law experience than a traditional family law course. And I think it really does give students the opportunity to test out what are we learning about the law and then what's really happening to people on the ground. Um, so anyway, that's an example of, I think, one um, model of trying to think through carefully how you might structure a new experiential learning program and how you might implement it. But I just encourage everybody who's thinking about that to think about the how and not just the imperative to do it. Thanks. Um, we have about, if people are willing to stay for a little bit longer, I think we have um, such a robust conversation that we could have, but we, have, we could do probably about 10 or 15 minutes of questions. I'm sure people have reactions, comments, thoughts. Brenda. Yes, and he, what he, and he agreed that this would count. I, people could substitute experiential courses for their teaching load up to a certain extent, right? They could do one a year, and they would have to negotiate what course they weren't going to teach, how much we needed those courses. That got very complicated and was sort of above my pay grade. But he did agree that if he wanted this, he knew he was going to have to let people out of other teaching commitments. So this is a great panel, all three presentations that I thought were, were awesome. Um, two questions for Bob. Uh, have you looked at um, comparing the cost of clinical faculty versus non-clinical faculty within schools? Right? So not the cost of clinical legal education, but, but what clinical faculty costs versus what non-clinical faculty costs uh, in terms of what they deliver in terms of you know, credit, credit, you know, credits in terms of courses offered, student service, that kind of thing. Uh, that's one question. The second is, any kind of way to do, is there any kind of way to do an ROI on clinical offerings, right? So, so one thing that I always feel is lost in this conversation of cost is, so there is a cost to any offering, right? But what's the return that you get uh, from that cost? And, and, and here, and I know law school deans aren't going to really care about this, but, but the return on investment to the student, right? So, so you know, taking a 90% a, a lecture class versus taking a clinic, which one of them pays them back in terms of uh, usefulness in their career more? And, and again, I don't know how one might do that, but, but just curious if you thought about it. Well, <clears throat> first on the issue of uh, trying to get, dig down into the cost of clinic versus non-clinical faculty, I mean, the short answer is no, because I really doubt if I can get that information except for my own school. Um, I do know that at my school, uh, because our, one of our associate deans runs our empirical center, he purported to put together a cost per type of class matrix. He, he, he went and looked at each individual faculty member's salary and benefits. He went and looked at what their teaching credits were, in a sense credits per student. And then he had a way of adding it up and came out with a cost, for example, how much a clinic course theoretically costs per credit versus all the rest. Um, I, I'm somewhat skeptical of that. I think that, that uh, what, what I've seen um, is that um, 
course, it depends on how many credits students get in clinic. But I think that many clinics can be run on the same cost as seminars. Um, if you think about it right, because you may have 12 students in a seminar at three credits, and you have you know, eight students, 10 students in a clinic at six or eight credits, right? Um, and so um, I think at least an argument could be made that if, in fact, the school's committed to making sure every student, because the ABA requires it, has a seminar experience, that surely it's possible to argue that they can surely afford the other. But, but what, I think that, therefore, I can't, I don't think I can do a universal sort of, here's what it appears clinical faculty make and produce, and here's the other. On the issue of uh, return on investment, uh, that's a great question, and that's, of course, the problem with all of this, is we, we, we can't, it's easy to measure the cost of clinical education. It's very hard to measure the benefits, right, other than these surveys of students when they get out. Um, I did recently, I can't remember the details, see, a, see an article um, that I showed to Karen Tokars uh, where they'd done something similar in some sort of medical context where they measured certain student attitudes or skills before and after they did certain rotations. And I wondered when I saw it, and I told her, I wonder if this is a methodology that we could use, right? Because we're all trying, you know, there's that article you know, the, the, the clinic effect, right? And if you read it, it, it we, we can't tell, right? It's very hard. Um, so I guess the, the, the short answer is I don't have any of that. And, and I think uh, it would be very hard to do, but I'm more than willing if somebody shows me how to, to think about it. Can I just, I just want to add to that. Um, this doesn't go directly, Praveen, to the question of the value, but one of the things that I encountered all the time at Georgetown was, people in the development office saying, we get more, in terms of um, uh, alumni donations to the right. school, we don't get that from clinic students because they all do public interest law. Hmm. Like, really? I wish all my pub, I, they do not. <laughs> if you, you know, Georgetown students don't do public interest law in large numbers, but they do take clinic if they can get in. And so I think another myth to bust uh, that's cost related, is that money that comes back to the law school, not to the student, may well come back from having had an experience that is so um, highly rated by the law students. They want to give to the law yeah, school. Yeah, so one of the things I, was, I thought about doing was just doing a survey of the web pages of schools. I mean, there is not a web page out there right now that doesn't prominently sell and brag on their clinical program. I mean, it's astounding, right? Now, I think it's because they too know it captures students that are interested in coming, but somebody surely thinks there's some value in it, either in attracting students or, or pleasing alums or whatever. It's just, I don't know how to measure any of that. Right. Yeah. Mike. Yeah, I'm, trying, I'm trying to visualize the teaching partnerships in no. these practices. <clears throat> you mentioned doctrinal teachers, uh, practitioners, uh, who assume are agents. And there's a third partner in here, or maybe not a big partner, and that's the supervisor of the placement. Now, I think that's sometimes the practitioner who comes with the doctrinal person. It should be the practitioner who's teaching with the doctrinal person. So, of your 33, can you, can you give us a, a sense of how many, are, you know, the, the perfect mm -hmm. match would be doctrinal, uh, a teacher, the clinical teacher, or doctrinal. Mm -hmm. And the place in supervisor. How many times have you got that out of the How many times is it just one teacher? If it's one teacher, that teacher is still supervising the student work. So whether there's two or one, they're not being farmed out to somebody else to supervise. Now, sometimes some of the work they're pulling somebody else in, but in every case, that was really critically important to us, to me. Um, that people who are in the classroom teaching know what's happening with these students on the ground because they're actively involved in this supervision. Not like clinic, right. um, but, but, they're, but they are aware of and part of the process of supervision. So you've got the placement person teaching. Yes. So I'd say that in all 33, the placement person teaching, the teaching. Yes. Exactly, yes. Or it's a project. So it may not, there may not be a placement. So it could be that we're talking, we had a, a 
practicum course called Motherhood and Criminality. And there were projects done in the DC jail, with women in the DC jail, uh, talking to them about know your rights kinds of projects. So there was no placement, but it was a doctrinal faculty member who cared about those issues, got access, and did, um, and did a white paper about something, I'm not sure what, in some community education. So the, so the, um, the client, relationship with the clients is all different kinds of lawyering, and some of them it requires less practice experience. Does that help? And I guess if I can just ask one follow-up question to that, it's one thing that had come to my mind, and it was a nice link, I think, to Jane's presentation in the last panel, which was in clinics, there is so much substantive law that comes into clinic. Um, and I keep thinking, is there a way to expand experiential learning opportunities by integrating um, experiential learning into podium classes in some way, and it sounds like the practicum courses are, are, are that plus, but is there a way to do it to a lesser extent where there could be some live client or other kinds of practice-based learning opportunities integrated into a podium class? I think people are doing that more and more um, at schools across the country, doing some kind of drop-in um, or more integrated stuff in a civil procedure course. It, sometimes it's simulation. Um, less frequently is it field work, but in some of the smaller courses, we're seeing a bunch of that. Um, and I, you know, the family law course that I taught, I'm not doing that anymore with my colleague, but she's doing a version of it because she had never practiced law. Um, but now she learned a lot about how to do that and she's able to do some supervision now. So I think you can go off on your own. Um, to pick up on your point, Sarah, I, mean, I, I actually don't particularly care for the whole practice-based learning and doctrinal learning. And when I talk to students about what they should be doing or what they could be doing here in law school, I talk about uh, knowledge-based courses, which would be essentially doctrinal, but then there's skill-based opportunities. And I, I think there's a, a broader range than just clinic and, and externship, and I think those are probably the foundation. But, um, you know, perhaps trying to, it, using that different language, trying to integrate doctrinal learning a bit more, trying to integrate clinical learning more into doctrinal learning. Um, so Luke Court, for example, I say there's, you know, I, I teach a course in environmental advocacy, and I say, look, we use environmental law, that's the doctrinal part, um, as a vehicle to teach a skill, you know, oral advocacy, written advocacy, and I want to ask the panelists, did you, did you in your research come across sort of more courses that focus on skills and that try to simulate, that try to bring, you know, aspects of practice into a classroom rather than just trying to do, let's create a clinic for Well, one of the things, if you hear James Moliterno talk about uh, some of the new courses they put together at WNL, They've created these very, very sophisticated simulated law practices. So they may have one on, you know, mergers and acquisition or bankruptcy or whatever. And the point of it is to, as you say, bring, and they're done by practitioners, that they bring in some very complex factual scenarios. And over the course of the semester, the students sort of struggle with it and get through it, right? So it's, it's still a simulation, but it's really a, a very high leveled simulation. Um, taught by practitioners bringing in, quite frankly, sort of real world problems? Um, I have no problem with skills-based simulation courses. I think students can learn an enormous amount from those courses, but it's very different kind of learning than live client work. Um, it's just different. You don't have factual chaos if you have a <laughs> set package of facts, even if you give it out in dribs and drabs. So that's why I don't use those language. And, that language to talk about the difference between doctrinal and skills as non-clinical and clinical. I don't think they're good proxies. You know, we talk a lot about doctrine in the clinic, and we talk a lot about the application of that doctrine to reality, and there's a lot of skills training too. But I don't think it works as a distinction um, all that well. And I would make one last set of observations, which is um, the, the current language about how to upgrade and intensify uh, practice-ready education 
is to move to think about competencies because of the integrated nature of what it is you need to know and the things you need to know to be able to move it forward in the world. And so while it's constructive to provide skills education in uh, about specific skills that require a lot of practice that don't necessarily require for the purpose of preliminary practice um, the factual chaos and fact sensitivity and live clients. Um, it is a tremendous um, allocation of resources to teach an entire course in any of these several skills. And so there used to be courses in um, you know, alternative dispute resolution, which would try to teach you three modes of <laughs> dispute resolution, um, or trial skills courses, which is an excellent place to use some of those. They do not teach um, the competency, uh, you know, how is it that you really ramp up what you do as an advocate. How is it that this interrelates with other choices that you might have in the skill sp or function spectrum? Um, and so, uh, and a lot of clinical education has fought long and hard to get away from the divide between education and skills, right? And so there still are folks who teach uh, podium courses who orient in the world and make that distinction that clinical stuff is just motor skills. I can think of three people on our faculty today. <laughs> but, um, at the, and that's not what we've been discussing. Yeah, no, I guess I, I might be just uh, spoiled in that. I know all the students I've talked to are going into clinic and doing that clinical experience. So I'm sort of able to talk to them more broadly and about mm -hmm. skills. I think one of the great disappointments for some of us who have spent the last five or six years trying to get the ABA to do something with its latest round of changes is their complete uh, disinterest in, in, in identifying and requiring competencies, at least a specific setup. I mean, they basically have punted and said, nah, school can decide whatever they want to teach and whatever they want to teach to. And so, again, I think, you know, I've often had um, social work students uh, intern or extern and in, in within our clinical programs, they have a mandatory requirement for that. And they have a most astounding set of competencies that they're supposed to, to, to measure or to, to achieve. And the interesting thing to me is even, even if you talk to one of them and they're doing much different kinds of social work, end goal, right? One of them might want to be a clinical social worker and another might want to do community economic development. They've been able to agree that there are some fundamental competencies that every student has to get. Maybe not at every placement, but, but before they graduate. And you know, you see the same thing in medical school, right? Is that even though in the fourth year you can kind of pick and choose where you want to go, in the third year, you know, you got to do that rotation through pediatrics or obstetrics or whatever. It doesn't matter whether you want to be, a, you know, a neurologist or neuroscientist or whatever. And so, that I think is maybe, you know, in in, in I'm sure in your lifetime, and I hope in mine, that, that we finally see some of those competencies coming to the fore and really dedicate mm -hmm. ourselves to them. Mm -hmm. And we'll get you, Deborah, to lead that, lead that internal effort to get there since you have that skill. <laughs> Just being mindful of the time, it is 518. Do we have time for one? Mike, did you have a final comment or question? No, I'll save it. For, next, in the, for, next, for, for the next four years. For the 80th anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.